Hey up and welcome back to the channel where this time we've uh, got a bit of a rare beast so if we're going to zoom in here what we actually have is a West Clocks it is called and this particular one is a West Clocks Scotland you can see it there proudly at the bottom claiming it's been made in Scotland now I'm sure you don't know but I actually live up here in, in Scotland not being from Scotland I'm English but um, I live up here in Scotland and basically this watch is how I get treated on an almost daily basis. It's only fair, I suppose. So you can see there it's missing a second's hand. And the crown actually just came straight off in my hand. So yes, this poor old girl is rather worse for wear. Now, I've labelled this as from the 60s. I've seen photos of these things looking like they're from the 60s. And um, quite frankly, that's as best as information as I have. So... As you can see from the start, I was actually struggling just to get into it, which was uh, quite surprising. And there we can see on the back is a, a lovely case back full of lies. And what it's held in by is this threaded trim ring. Now, I could have used a, a proper watch back opener, but, you know, I had the old tweezers there. So I thought I'd give it a go. And I was lucky. So, yes, as I say, it's full of lies because it's waterproof, shockproof and anti-magnetic. And neither one of those is true. It's as waterproof as that duff rubber seal is around the outside. Now you've seen in the uh, in the title, I've said it's a pocket watch for the wrist, or words to that effect, and that is where I'm referring to it being a pocket watch of the wrist. Look at the state of that movement. I say look at the state of it. It's quite quaint, really. It's quite sweet, but um, it's no smarter than you'd get on a standard standard pocket watch. It's very slow. Um, low impulse and that's just what it is but dropping it out of the case which again is just a very very cheap and simple sort of brass plated case we release this lovely enameled face of the watch and to be fair the watch face is actually very pretty as always first things first is uh, to get the hands off the watch now i'd never actually heard of west clocks and the only reason I bought this is because it said it was made in Scotland. I've actually had quite a good time looking into them. So, West Clocks was actually an American company. So, it was founded in America years and years ago. It was actually founded in 1888 as the Western Clock Manufacturing Company, which then got um, shortened to West Clocks. And the company received a patent for the Big Ben alarm clock movement. So, for those of you who have heard of an, or a Big Ben alarm clock, um, this is where it's come from. It's come from these guys. So these guys actually had quite a, a checkered history. They've been in and out of redundancy more times than not. And the company West Clocks is indeed now just a name. It is not actually a, uh, a developing company anymore. So again, more evidence of this being based off a of pocket watch. Those tabs are exactly like we had on the first two episodes of this channel. Was based on a pocket watch and there I am just struggling with a crown pinion I really probably should get a uh, I keep calling it a crown pinion I really probably should get a uh, removal tool for those so yeah as I say um, the company actually went bust they, <laughs> they went bust quite a while ago but it's now actually uh, been taken on the company was bought out by Sultan Inc in uh, 2001 after it went bankrupt I say they bought the company. What they actually bought was the name West Clocks and Big Ben, because that was all that was worth buying. And then in 2007, Sultan uh, sold his entire business and sold the names to an NYL Holding Limited, and that's about all we got. So you see, because the crown's actually stuck in with the winding stem, it was actually incredibly easy just to let down that mainspring. So obviously this wasn't running, but it did have a full wind in it, so clearly it's just something gumming up the... Uh, coming up the works as to why this wasn't working and you see i'm rapidly accelerating through the disassembly of this watch but to be perfectly honest with you there's not actually <laughs> a whole lot to dissemble on this i said uh, there must be about 25 pieces of the entire thing and they're all lovely big brass on brass metal on metal just like you get in a pocket watch so you know if you see one of these floating about and you're wanting the sort of the next stage into horology and watchmaking I dare say that this will um, this will do you well. It is actually quite 
uniquely engineered. You can see we've got four screws holding on the, uh, I suppose you'd call it a bridge, um, for that. But those four screws are actually also holding on those two mini bridges and this little, um, this little retainer clip. I'd call it like a, a circlip with a screw in it, I suppose, because it is going into a, uh, to a turn down groove on that shaft, which is holding in the uh, stem. But it's, uh, they've been very economical with, with their fittings, we'll say. So as I say, West Clocks Scotland were indeed made in Scotland and they were a subsidiary of this brand. They were made in Scotland in Dumbarton, which isn't actually a million miles from where I work. I work in Glenrothes and these were made in Dumbarton, so they're not entire miles away. And these were made over four decades, 1948 to 1988. Initially, they were going to go into production in 1939, but of course, um, well, certain people who know the history might might think something else happened then so yeah obviously world war ii struck up they decided probably not the best time to go into making watches but the american company west clocks did actually make a fortune off of uh off of wearing watches if you remember a couple of episodes ago when we were playing with that rotary and they become a household name it was the exact same scenario um but in america with these west clocks so the scottish factory of these um they like i said they first started in 1948 and they made millions of these things. Uh, in 1949, obviously the year after they opened, they were making 10,000 a week. Uh, by 1950, they'd made a million. And I'm just trying to see if there's any numbers as to how many they'd made. But they made loads of them. This was quite an intensive sight as well for the West Cox Company. And again, just to uh, talk over myself there, quite an interesting little bridge that is. That is a bridge just to hold the escapement and the pallet fork. Everything else is all held on the one bridge, but I suppose it just makes your life that little bit easier. I was quite a fan of that, to be honest with you. I thought that was for such a simple design, especially when you get the pocket watches, you've got so many different pivots to try and line up, but that just makes your life that little bit easier because you can get them all in. You can test the movement as well, of course, by spinning up that mainspring, and then, um, and then you can drop those on after the fact. And you see with all those screws removed and those two safely out of the way, we can actually split that bridge from the main chassis of the watch. And there is that oh, there is that balance wheel on that hairspring very carefully there. Very, very carefully, as always, because those really do like to crimp and bend. And just try and do anything to, to destroy yourself. But while I've got it, I'm just going to take out that second pivot or the second hand. Now we're going to have to try and find a second hand because of course this one didn't have one, but I'm sure we can. So to talk further about the West Clocks Company, this was quite an, this was quite an intensive sign. So sort of 1967-68, 400 people were paid off, the plant was in doubt. Um, there was watches being flooded in basically from the, from the Slavic countries, the Iron, Iron Curtain countries as they like to say. Um, and then the government, the UK government, this is in a very out of character move, decided to um, basically pass an anti-dumping law on them. So you can't, you, you couldn't bring uh, lots of stuff in, which that, well, frankly, that never happens. Obviously, without getting too much into UK politics, if we had a bit of that going on at the moment, we might, we might see a, fair, a little bit more prosperity going on, but that's a conversation for another day. But anyway, after that, the, um, the factory picked up its production. So, yeah, and the, the site running, it got it got bigger and better, and then they started uh, started even making quartz watches, and uh, it was that popular. These quartz watches were in October nineteen seventy four. They hosted a space seminar with Neil Armstrong, the Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon, and Sir Patrick Moore, obviously a British astronomer, and they both came to the factory just to talk about how important and how good quartz timekeeping was. So. You know, these guys weren't messing around, and this this site wasn't just some cottage industry. I mean, the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh and that come round. I mean, I think I was um, just looking up here, 1971, a film by the BBC, and that's you know they came round and toured the site. So it really was quite a uh, quite a site. And I suppose that for simple as this little pocket watch is, I say it's a pocket watch. It's not, of course, it's a wrist watch. But look at it, <laughs> it's a pocket watch. Um, you know, as 
as simple as it is, it's been engineered that way, which is one of those things which I really like. I like when you look at something and you go, God, that's simple. But it's simple because it's no more complex than it needs to be. I mean, I repaired this watch a, a while ago uh, before recording this audio over a course, so it's probably been a, a week and a bit. And it's still still keeping time. Just give it a bit of a wind, and and there it goes. It's 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 more than happy. So just look at this mainspring, carbon steel, anti-magnetic my ass, and look at there. That's something I've not seen before. The end of the mainspring is actually pinned and riveted into the barrel. You think I'm going to remove that? You're absolutely dreaming. And there we go. That's all these parts now sitting in their isopropyl alcohol, and this is all that goes into making this watch. That's it. And that includes half the parts that I put them together. So there you go. Ten minutes of video. That's that's the watch stripped to bits and cleaned. I think this is going to be a new personal best for for short videos. I know I wanted did a couple was quite long. I don't think people like that so much. So if you've got comments and if you think the videos are too long or too short, please do feel free just to give us a shout. Because like I say, I want to do these and I want I want people to watch them. So if you think they're too short or too long, then you let me know and I'll see what I can do. So now everything's clean. We're going to go and get this all dropped back in. This anti-magnetic steel spring. Still makes me laugh. So, as I say, these watches weren't around forever. And they're not made now. So 1988, that's when this factory shut. And it's quite ironic, really. In 1974, uh, just 12 years before it shut, um, they had Neil Armstrong and Patrick Moore coming around to, you know, say how important quartz timekeeping was, and ultimately that was that was the death nail of this watch company. Um, this was a mechanical watch; all they made was mechanical timepieces. I'm not going to say watches because they actually made a lot of alarm clocks as well, but ultimately they were all quartz, and yeah, these guys just couldn't keep up, unfortunately, and um, that was the end of them. So in 1988, they shut. And now the factory has been levelled, and as with anything, it's um, it's it's a housing estate basically. <laughs> so it's a housing estate, and there's um, small businesses on it. And you know, if I'm ever out that way again, I do I do see some places, and I do go past Dumbarton a bit. So I might drop in and might drop in and see what it's like. But for now, um, yeah, it, it's houses. But apparently, there's still a wall there with some um, inscriptions of commemor commemoration from the time of the year. Uh, Queen and Duke of Edinburgh visited, etc. And um, so there's still some sort of evidence of it being there, but unfortunately it's just nothing, nothing, nothing dreadfully important, nothing substantial, we'll say. So now that we're uh, all about the, all the history's gone, let's look at getting this put back together. So you see, I've gone and I've tried to clean the pivot holes out as best I can, because you'll note there's not a single jewel here. It's all brass on brass. So what I'm doing is for the high speed pieces I'm going with a bit of a Mobius 9010 just to try and keep it well lubricated. For the heavier pieces such as this I'm going in with the 9050, uh, 9050 sorry for the, the 1500 HP, 1500. And they see I'm just going in, I'm just really trying to make sure it permeates all the way through. And what I'm also trying to do is put a, a small amount in that cup, a small amount of a 9010 in that cup. That was for the balance wheel of course. So I'm hoping it's going to ride on a, on a frictionless cushion, just like a uh, turbo shaft on a journal. So it's come to bits. Now let's start putting it back together. So first things first, we're going to be going in with this minute hand, as it's going to be. The minute wheel, the main drive wheel, the hour hand goes on afterwards. And of course, the second hand goes through the middle. I will try to make sure I get all these the right way around. For some reason, it's just one of the things that I just can't seem to get right. So here we are, and then we've got this second intermediate wheel for the uh, drivetrain going in. And then looking at it, I think, hang about, no point putting that in just yet, because we've got to drop this guy in first. And you can see that this is tight. This is very tight indeed. And again, it's all brass on brass. So when it says on the uh, on the case it's shockproof, quite what's so shockproof about it, God only knows. Because I know that I don't. But... Surprisingly, all the tolerances are still quite well, all being brass on brass. But you can see there now, just where those two wheels at, where those two wheels meet, there is that teeny tiny little hole, and that is where we've got to try and get this, uh, try and go, on, try and get this wheel. You 
It's hard. <laughs> it's very hard. I'm trying to do it. Just, just trying to get the bottom somewhere near. I'm not bothered about it all aligning just yet. I just want to try and get it near and hope I can fettle it up from there. And I think that's just about in. You know, I'll try and give it a bit of, bit of swing up. And there you go. And now they're, they're, those are all sitting lovely there. Look. Probably me, I'm never happy. What I've found really helps is if you can just try and get them all meshing with the teeth first. That really helps. So when you're not trying to, uh, not trying to align it with the bridge, if you know what I mean. And that's in. Best put that uh, that mainspring back in. I also found it curious how there's no no lid to that barrel. It's just completely uh, open to the elements, as it were. I suppose they had their reasons for it. I suppose it's mostly covered by the. Uh, the bridge, if you will, when you when you put it back together, but it doesn't mean I like it. So as I was saying, you need to make sure those gears are meshing together. Otherwise, there's just simply no way that you're going to get the um, the pivots to line up with the corresponding holes. Now, there's no pallet fork to line this up to, which again is quite curious. So all we've got to do is make sure we're sitting in that cup with its oil, and then it should just be a case of aligning it all up. And giving it a bit of a touch back and forth, and you'll realise that there's been a mistake here, and it's never going to go together. What a stupid bit of design that is. We've actually got to get that bent tab underneath that intermediate wheel there, because that's what the uh, second um, the second wheel aligns onto. So whoever thought that was a good bit of design, wants well, putting against the wall and shooting, frankly. So you've almost got to try and bring it straight down unaligned and then sort of push it forward to line it up with the, the posts and the rest of the pivots it's a bloody shocking bit of design unless of course it's been put together by a machine or it's been put together out of sequence so from the top down regardless to be honest with you i'm just not a fan it reminds me of a, uh, a car i used to had used to have where I take the exhaust manifold off you've got to undo all the bolts and pull the exhaust manifold forward to uh, actually spin the bolts out the rest of the way I just don't like that. And you can see there's a, a lot of faff trying to get this to, to line up. But I think that's just about got it there. We need to make sure it's angled back. Yeah, and then pull it forward. And then it should drop down onto the uh, onto the pivot hole, which indeed it has done there. And then I'm just showing what I was looking around for me, uh, me uh, air jet there. That's one thing that I've seen other people do. And I'm a big fan of it, just to make sure that uh, balance wheel is indeed spinning freely back and forth. So... Now it's in, I don't want to move. <laughs> so to make sure it doesn't move, I'm going to drop a couple of these screws in. As I say, it was very uh, economical with its use of screws in that, you know, one screw does multiple things, but I'm just going to get them in for now. Even if they have to come out a little bit later on, I'm just going to get them in now to make sure that the pivots don't go anywhere. Just so we can assemble the rest of the watch. That's uh, an old trick I've been taught by uh, many people. I'm an engineer by trade, so lots of nuts and bolts in and out and in and out. And what I've always been told is if you can see an opportunity to get a nut and bolt in when you're working on something difficult, get it in. A lot of people don't. They go for the most difficult one first, but don't. Go for the easy ones. Because then once they're in, there's nothing to stop you from slacking it off slightly and playing around and getting it near and then getting another one in. And That's exactly what I'm doing here. So you can see I was just testing the, uh, testing the gear train. And now I'm just testing that balance, and you see, I've got a very sensitive problem here. That hairspring shouldn't look like that, should it? I don't know why it looks like that. It's like it's pulled out of the um, of the clamp. And now my heart was in my mouth, and I don't really know what to do, because I don't want to start playing with it. So what do I do? I start playing with it. <laughs> you can see all it is is a tapered pin. Uh, I pulled out, I pushed that hairspring back, and now I'm just going to very, very gently drop that taper spring back in, and now I'm just going to give it a little bit of push ever so gently. And you may be looking at this thinking there's a slight issue, and you're right, there is a slight issue, but we'll come to that a little bit later on. But hey, as far as I'm aware, that looks good there. So you can see it's all lined up, and now I'm just going to give that a, a push home, not too hard, because if you go too hard and slip off, you're knackering that hairspring. But look at that, that's looking just about spotty dog. 
So now here's we can get these last two components in for the actual uh, watch works itself. So I wasn't sure whether to get the the um, escapement in first or the pallet fork, but I got the impression that the pallet fork was going to be more of a pain in the ass than the escapement. So that went in first, and it got aligned up with the old balance wheel. And now I'm going to try and chuck that escapement underneath the uh, tabs of that pallet fork. This was a this is a good patience test. This one I did enjoy it. So now that we're in uh, the holes, or the oh, I, can't, I can't say jewels, can I? But we're in the uh, in the pivot holes. Got to make sure it's all lined up, and then that top bridge can go on. You can see there's a lot of pivoting, a lot of playing back and forth, and a lot of making sure that balance wheel actually spins. Look at that look straight on. He says, with a little bit of fettling. And straight on. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a treat to work on this. I wish I could have got it cleaner. I problem is all the solutions I have seem to uh, make brass look worse rather than make it look cleaner. So if you know of something out there which may help, please do feel free to give me a shout. And look at that. That balance wheel is indeed ticking back and forth on that pallet fork. Now, as I said before, um, there was a mild issue when I put that hairspring back in. I actually put it in far too far, so I struggle to get it to uh, start running in the first instance. And I don't know if I show that here or if I show that a little bit later on. But um, it is indeed remedied. But before we remedy that, let's just uh, get the rest of the watch put back together. We've got time yet. So now it's just that final bridge. I suppose you'd call it a bridge for the old uh, mainspring. But there we go. And we just line those up and drop the screws back in. And the uh, that's it. The old girl's good to go. And there really, really is nothing to this watch, is there? There's not a lot at all. I like that. <laughs> I'm quite, a, quite a, a big fan of that. It's very simple. Very low amplitude. And very simple. But um, yeah. Yeah, it's nice. It's a refreshing change. So let's get this ratchet wheel drop back in, and that will allow the watch to uh, take a wind. And with the wind on it, or the ratchet wheel on it rather, let's just give it a bit of a, uh, a further lubrication. Obviously, this is the side which hasn't been done. This is the top of the bridge. And again, as always, I'm putting in far too much. But in the instance of this, I don't think that's probably too bad of a thing. Because this old girl is... Um, Looking a bit sorry for herself. What would be ideal is if I could find like the smallest ream in the world and chuck it through those holes first, or just even if it's just like a um, like a pipe cleaner and chuck it through. But I don't know how feasible that is. Made in UK. Don't see that too much anymore. And that's just a bit more of the old HP fifteen hundred down over um down over that again. I did clean them off a of Rodico. And the back side of this now, that's the uh, pallet fork and that's the escapement wheel. On a normal watch and a normal jewel, you'd just make sure they were clean and you wouldn't actually lubricate them at all because any friction on those is a, is a no-no. But on this, because it's brass on brass, I thought, well, they need something, anything really. So with the um, lubrication done, we can drop that stem back in. And we can give it a bit of a wind. You can see it doesn't look like it's wanting to do too much. And that's what I was saying before about um, that hairspring putting it in too far. So I'd actually put it in too far. And you can see it's trying to spring into life there. It's all loosey-goosey. But it keeps stopping. And what I've actually done is effectively play with the timing of the watch that much. It isn't ticking and tocking. It's going tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick. Which might be a very difficult and... Um, quite funny way of explaining it but it's true you see that little dial at the top though which lets you adjust the timing i'd effectively made it far far too slow with the timing so all i had to do is pull that pin back out and let a bit of the slack of that hair spring back out and i actually let a little bit more out and it seemed to find also like a pre-bend but it found a point it was happy with and i left it there and put it back together and it's ran at perfect time since so to me that's where it wanted to be so there's no strict keyless works on this i suppose there is and i suppose this is what i'm playing with now the old keyless works but 
there's nothing like you'd like you'd realize in a modern watch but there is this nice little um retainer that I was i was playing with before that i need to use to make sure that the um stem actually gets trapped in but to put that on i've got to remove this screw to put that carrier back in with the little um circlip slot i suppose you'd call it just to make sure it all engages and that actually retains that um that stem retriever i don't know what you'd call it you can see it all all keys together you've got a nice little slot in there so you can just slacken off that screw and knock it backwards Another thing to be mindful of for these watches is something I've come across before is that they're on posts. If you look at these um, bridges, they're on posts. They're not all keyed in together and they're not doweled in together. So if you find that it's not running very nice, it might be beneficial for you just to undo all the screws in sequence and tighten them back up bit by bit. Because what you can do is you can actually crimp one side of it more than another. They don't do any damage, but it'll just put additional stress on one side of it, which will, for instance, put stress on additional pivots. So we're almost there with the reassembly of the watch. All we've got to do is drop on this um, retainer for the ratchet wheel. And that is uh, on a little dowel you can see there. And all you've got to do is basically push that over to the dowel like that. Get the screw before, uh, before it changes its mind and do the screw up. On this side there's not really much lubrication to do at all. Just a little bit I decided to put on this keyless works here. Because that crown had come off in the past... To me, it seemed like it was having additional force on it than it should have. It's only splined, it's not retained. So I feel like it should be easier to operate than it was. And it was just tried before. So we're just going to go with some lovely synthetic grease on there. Blue flavour, my favourite. And that should hopefully make that a little bit easier to move. And again, I've probably over it and gone with too much. But this is the uh, the fun of the hobby, isn't it? Trying to make sure you do things as much as you need to and not any more. So now we're all running. Let's drop that cannon pinion back on. Again, we just need to make sure that the old teeth are aligned with that intermediate wheel next to it. As far as I can tell, that is actually only an idle wheel, which is actually going to transfer the minute movement to hours. So I dare say the ratio between these cannon pinions, that intermediate wheel, and the hour wheel, which is going on now, is probably about 60 to 1, as in 60 revolutions of one as one or the other. So now we've got a running watch. The motion works and what there is of it is assembled. And so even on this, it's incredibly satisfying to watch, isn't it? Just look at it going around and ticking like a good one. Anyway, sorry, um, that's the thrust washer gone on. I'm just giving it a little bit of lubrication because this does run up directly against that face. And that is really all that will be left to do, is to uh, drop the face against it. Oh no, I'm sorry, I've lied to you. The face wouldn't go out of nowhere, would it? We need to put this ring on first. All these pieces, and I'm still making a fool out of myself by getting them out of sequence. That's much better, isn't it? So with it all in and on, and that thrust washer on and lubricated, let's get that face put back on. Now this can only go one way, of course. Um has to only go one way, naturally. And what one has to bear in mind is that these tabs that I'm playing with now will go brittle over time. Of course, any material, any metal I should say rather, that you um, keep them moving back and forth and back and forth, it will work hard and go brittle over time, and eventually these tabs can snap off. Now... In one of my previous videos, I had one of the, it looked like one of the tabs had snapped off and it hadn't actually. The paint had come off from the tab. It's just something to be mindful of because if that falls down inside your watch, then you know, you've just spent all this time servicing the thing and you're putting it back together and it's knackered. But luckily, that's not the case with this. They all bent back just lovely. And that's one of the great things about these old watches is you have these fantastic enamel dials. So it really is um, genuine enamel. It's a bit of a brass or aluminium or steel. And it's got 
enamel paint painted on the one side and normally they've actually got clear enamel on the other side and then they are baked in a kiln of some description to make the enamel completely flash and go into one hard um one hard coating and i say it's hard it really is hard it's like woodpecker lips and then it's probably screen printed over afterwards now the sort of 70s and 80s screen printing is probably done with like a water-based dye but this has got everything in it which can kill you i mean this is this will be this will be lead and asbestos and radioactive and oh brilliant but i tell you what a fantastic finish it does give look at that it's it's gleaming and i'm, I'm a very big fan of these screen printed um logos as well and as i say um it's got enamel on the back also because if you think about it if you're doing something to one side of that as it cools it's going to shrink it actually causes it to pull so it um actually dished the other way and you end up with a horrible wavy warped face so that's why they've often got enamel on the back so let's get this reassembled we've come this far let's stick some hands on it so that's the uh, hour hand clicked in again i should probably look at a proper pusher for this but i'm not too concerned just yet and now we've got the minute hand thank you very much i've gone two for three i'm 66 percent of the way there not doing too bad that's just a little bit dirty for my liking so what i'm going to do very quickly is i'm just going to give it just a little bit of a uh, little bit of a brush up now you can probably get polishes for this where it do the job properly or you could stick it in some rodico but to be honest with you i'm not too interested in making it that perfect because i do like the look of it so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to go with one of these fiberglass pens and just give it a nice pull in a straight direction very gently on that gel cushion just to knock off the worst of the oxide and that should leave it pretty well gleaming and not too abused and you can see it looks like it's gone black but it's not that's just um it's just what it's reflecting and you can see again very very gently playing with it um and there you go that's actually it looks like it's gone black but it hasn't it's just reflecting the black which is above it again one thing that i really really take the time to do is make sure those hands are aligned properly because it's one of my pet peeves indeed it was uh, the reason i opened my first watch was to align the hands on it after it fell off my wrist and the hands bumped around i wouldn't mind that was um that was my uh, amiga speedmaster not the moon watch i love to wear it's um that was my first watch which was the uh, automatic reduced so here we are this is the one of my first victims which never went back together i can gladly say it wasn't me on this it had a broken pallet fork as it had no um, shock setting it must have been dropped at some point but in there was a minute hand uh, sorry a second hand damn it, i knew that was going to happen <laughs> and you can see we can drop the old casing back on now there's a reason i didn't show you putting that second hand on and that's because it was an absolute pain in the hoop as the scottish would say you see that second wheel as it goes through all it's retained by is that teeny teeny tiny little spring so what you've actually got to do is try and hold the second hand in hold that pivot in whilst you try and push the second hand on from the other side because otherwise it's just going to push that straight back out and um frankly that was a nightmare and it just didn't make for interesting viewing <laughs> so it um it got put on so even though I mentioned about having this uh, retainer being very easy to operate, I just undone the screw there somewhat so I can move it back ever so slightly, just like that. So I can push that little shaft through, which should give me just enough, there you go, deflection to get that stem in and then get retained by it. I'm just, just double checking, triple checking, making sure it's okay. I'm just giving it a trial pull as well. And lo and behold, everything seems to be all kosher. Now the stem didn't actually require that much um, repair with that crown. Like I say, it was a spline, and it actually split. So I think it just been it been ripped off and then tried to be hammered on or something. So all I did is I put a small amount of a uh, Loctite on the inside of that crown, give it a small love tap, and um, yeah, she was she's pretty well set and she hasn't come off since. Now I've I've given it a bit a bit of hammer, but obviously I'm trying to be sensible about it because at the end of the day it's not going to be at its full strength is it so with that now back through i can realign that push it back up do that screw back up and we are good to go look at it still clattering round merry as you like absolutely lovely little thing 
now we've pulled, got this lovely little uh, trim ring to go in. I don't actually know what it's for. I don't know if this is the uh, the shock absorber that they called it or whatever. Frankly, I just think it's a spacer for the um, for the case back. Uh, the seal was actually in quite good condition, mainly because I don't think it's actually been crimped on. So all I did is I took it out, cleaned it, um, and I gave it a bit of a, a soak in some some very light oil because I know that can rejuvenate an old seal. Then we drop that case back back in, and you notice that case back is actually um, on a key up the top there, so it actually cannot rotate anymore. But I suppose you want that logo to be a uh, logo to be in the right place. With how pivotal it is. I mean, waterproof, shockproof, and anti-magnetic. Three lies on the back of that watch. <laughs> it's the, uh, it's the, um, the trifecta of disgrace. So I'm going to tighten it back up like that just to make sure it's okay. And then once I'm quite confident that it's, it's going to run okay, I'll, um, I'll get it cinched down with the proper uh, case back tool. So what I'm doing here is I'm just pulling the, uh, pulling the stem out. Give well, I was actually giving it a bit of a wind, but now I've done that, I'll um, spin it around. And I'll set it at the right time. And you can see it seems to be clattering around on the inside of there. And frankly that's because it is. But it can only be made as good as it can, you know. You'll see the case I haven't actually touched all that much. All I've done basically is given that crystal a bit of a polish. I didn't think it needed too much more. And frankly I quite like the bit of charm that it had. Um, I seem to clean these up all the time. And I actually quite like it. <laughs> like that, you know, I, I love the reflection of an acrylic crystal. I love the um, the uh, ocular refraction it gives, I suppose you say. And now we're going to do the the actual clinical test of just comparing it with the watch that slingshotted the moon. 14 second burn timed on the um, Speedmaster Moonwatch. And so far I've timed everything in my life using the Speedmaster Moonwatch. And to be honest with you, I'm not even comparing the watches anymore. This is literally just an excuse to show off the prettiest thing that I own which is that absolutely brilliant piece of kit. And you know what the thing on the left? I bet it cost an absolute fraction of it. I bet it, wasn't, it doesn't even cost a percent of what that watch on the right costs, but it ticks the exact same. <laughs> I, bet it does, uh, I bet it keeps okay time too. And yeah, as I was saying about crystals, funnily enough, both watches have acrylic crystals. The one on the left and the one on the right both have polishable acrylic crystals. But the speedy on the right has actually got a tiny little Omega symbol right in the centre of the crystal to let you know that it is a genuine Omega part. And there you go, I've stopped it um, about 59.2 seconds. But I think in reality it wasn't. It would have been about right. I just got a bit trigger happy. So, as always, we've got a watch. It's running. We've polished the crystal. Let's uh let's have some beauty shots over it, I think. As always, what I want to try and do is make sure that I actually make a watch rather than just a timepiece. And no watch is complete without a strap, and just a plain tan strap I think suited it well. And there you go. <laughs> she really is a lovely little Scottish dress watch now. And as I sit here recording, I am finishing off that bottle of Jura. Very nice single malt Scotch whiskey. I hope you enjoyed this from where I live. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.